So the topic today is uh, airway anesthesia for airway surgery. Uh, it's a very big topic, so uh, I cannot cover it in one lecture. So I, I will go through the general consideration or general anesthetic management for airway surgery and sharing airway and focusing on the most important uh, surgeries and the most common one. So first, uh, at the end of this lecture, I'm hoping that the candidate uh, will be able to do pre-operative assessment, planning, and communication before induction of anesthesia for those kind of patients, and to classify the choices for airway management based on the surgical procedures, and also to be able to know about the modalities for uh, of ventilation for sharing airway surgery, and uh, last, uh, lastly, the hazards and precautions for laser, laser surgery. So this is our objectives today. Uh, so we'll go first for general anesthetic consideration, as I said, and then the main bulk of the lecture will go will be the airway management and ventilation, and post-operative care for those kind of patients after the surgery, and some specific uh, surgical procedures. So the challenges facing any anesthetist going to put patients sleep for airway surgery is how to provide oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal and proper ventilation for those patients. Uh, the second point is adequate depth of anesthesia and avoid risk of awareness. Uh, smooth recovery with intact airway. Most of these patients are uh, scheduled for day case surgery and they should go home at the same time. So you sh they should have an intact airway. Uh, and, again, and the last point is to appreciate the need of the surgeons for the surgical access. Actually, there is always conflict between the surgeons and the anesthetists uh, in this point. Both of them are sharing the airway. But the, from the surgical point of view, the surgeons, he wants a tubeless field, okay? So to not hide uh, the surgical field, he wants completely immobile vocal cords or airway with profound muscle relaxation. On the other side, the anesthetist, he wants to secure the airway to avoid any uh, risk of aspiration, to maintain proper ventilation. So usually there's a conflict between both of them and they should find a midpoint to be agreed. That's why communication between the surgeons and the anesthetist is paramount. So for pre-operative preparation for this patient or what I have to do before the surgery, to be aware about the patient population. So most of uh, patients uh, presented for airway surgery uh, for adult patients they are smokers and of course as a result of that they can be ischemic heart disease COPD and lung disease some of them are young and healthy uh, uh, patients presented for uh, removal of vocal cord polyp or single nodule <coughs> nodules uh, again I'm focusing today on the adult not pediatric airway management so um, the second point is the clinical presentation for those patients. Uh, the majority of them, if they are listed for elective surgery, they, they are asymptomatic. But others also, they have changes in voice, hoarseness of voice, dysphagia, and if the lesion is significant, they can be presented by minor strider. But what I want to point also, if the patient is asymptomatic from this uh, aspect, uh, always suspect difficult airway management for them. Actually, 16% of patients presented for ENT surgery, they have a difficult airway issues. The third point is general examination. The usual what we are doing before any surgery, okay, and uh, airway assessment is very important in this kind of surgery. Airway assessment for difficult intubation, difficult mask ventilation. I will not go in detail for this one in, in this lecture, but because uh, really you have to be ready for any uh, difficult airway scenario so you have the patient should be properly assessed before the surgery from the airway aspect investigations like chest x-ray ct scan or mri and nasoscopy usually uh, performed by the surgeons as a, uh, in, in preparation of the patient for the surgery it's very important to check the ct scans before the surgery uh, to see where is the level of the obstruction? Is it supraglottic or glottic or subglottic? And how is the uh, what's the how how bad is the narrowing of the airway? And most of them they have nasal endoscopy, 
also give you an idea about the size of the lesion and where is the lesion? Is it on anterior commissure of the vocal cord and or the posterior commissure of the vocal cords? We'll come through this one in the next slide. At the end, the, the anesthetic and surgical plan is very important uh, between uh, both of the surgeons and the anesthetist. And again, to communication is very important between them. On the left side here, this is the CT scan showing right vocal cord tumor. Okay, on the level of vocal cord, and you can see it's my displacement of the trachea. And this gives you an idea about the size of the intratracheal tube that we are planning to use. On the right side here, you can see this is supraglottic mass. Okay, on the uh, right side also, although the glottic area is fine, but this patient is a, uh, was is asymptomatic uh, at rest, but he developed stridor on exertion. This is examples also for nasal endoscopy. As I can see here, there's a big tumor on the left of, uh, vocal cord, and that taking the anterior two thirds of the of the vocal cord. On the other side here, this is big mass covering the supraglottic uh, area. Of course, if you can compare between this one, I want you to know how this one will give you idea about your anesthetic plan or airway management. It will be easy to put tube here in this one. You have patent posterior commissure here. Although on the other side, it's presents very difficult. So your option will go, for example, for awake uh, tracheostomy if the patient is stridorous and, and present as an emergency airway. Again, surgical plan will dictate your anesthetic management plan. So you have to ask yourself three questions and to find answers for this one. Will intubation impede surgical access? Yes or no? If the tubeless field is required, so you cannot put in a tube. So how I will oxygenate and maintain ventilation for this patient? How the surgery will alter the airway? Is it, it will improve the airway after the surgery or expecting uh, deterioration like, for example, edema or bloody surgery. This is an example, again, how uh, the, the site of the lesion will affect uh, my decision. Most of the surgeons, if the lesion is on the anterior commissure of the vocal cord, okay, the, no need to, uh, it's fine for them to put a small tube. We'll go through this one next slides. But for example, if in the posterior commercial vocal cord, if you are putting tube here, it will hide uh, to make the excision of this tumor difficult for them. Intraoperatively, uh, in terms of monitoring, uh, we are using usually a short procedure uh, using uh, monitoring like uh, non-invasive blood pressure, uh, pulse oximeter, ECG, AGP uh, guideline monitoring. And we can use also transcutaneous carbon dioxide monitoring especially in tubeless uh, ventilation. Best also sometimes required because we are using uh, uh, TIVA and, and this kind of surgery sometimes, and the risk of awareness is high. And the train of four to monitoring the, uh, the muscle uh, uh, relaxation, because also we need them to be fully relaxed during the surgery. And during recovery, you have to be sure that the, the effect of the muscle relaxant is uh, weird off. In terms of induction, we have three types of induction, either inhalation induction or our conventional IV induction or uh, total intravenous anesthesia. Airway management and ventilation technique, we'll discuss them in the next slides in details. Positioning is very important because most of this kind of patients, their neck is fully extended. So you have to protect uh, and examine the patient before the surgery first about uh, the neck, range of neck movement. Majority of these patients, they have radiotherapy. So post-radiation, there is a limitation of the neck movement. And if there's any atlantoaxial uh, joint, like in arthritis or something, it's very important to clarify this one before the surgery. If you can see here how the neck is extended, okay? And in terms of the eye protection, you have to tap the eyes, put pads of the eyes, okay? Uh, teeth protection by teeth guard to protect any damage in the teeth. This is also to be sure that uh, all this when protecting. They are putting shoulder, uh, uh, shoulder to lift up. Agents inhalational or by TIVA. Um, it's very important to minimize the stress response. It's very stressful. Okay, so we are doing this one 
by uh, either spraying the lidocaine uh, 4% on the vocal cord and, and upper airway, or by using short ending opioid like remifentanil. Airway management and ventilation. We have two choices according to the surgery and according to the lesion. So if the first choice is to put in the tracheal tube and start closed circuit ventilation, intermittent uh, positive pressure ventilation. So to put the endotracheal tube, we have three options. Either we put it uh, conventional tracheal intubation using uh, di direct laryngoscopy or magra, whatever you want, or we'll use awake tracheal intubation if we suspect difficult airway management, either fiber optic or video assisted, or we'll go for awake tracheostomy. The second option here is tubeless field and open circuit ventilation. So either we keep the patient under spontaneous ventilation, which is really un, uh, which is uh, rare to do that or uncommon, using only in pediatric population or if you want to measure the dynamic of the cords, uh, or using apneic oxygenation using Thrive technique or apneic intermittent ventilation or jet ventilation. We'll go in details for this one. So if I go to insert into tracheal tube, the most common tube used is the MLT microlingual tube. The microlingual tube is present in size four, five, and six. Most commonly, we are using five for adults. And you can see here the difference. This is size five MLT, and this is size five normal PVC tube. You can see this is longer, longer, so it's 31 centimeter. If I insert this one in adults, it will be the tip of uh, the, the highest part of the tube will be at the angle of the mouse, easy to be dislodged and uh, not convenient uh, during the surgery. That's why the taller one is better. Or, you could, or if you are doing laser surgery, you can use either wrapped uh, uh, standard LT tube, you are wrapping it by foil, or laser specialized intracranial tube. There is two types of tube, either uh, without cuff for pediatric, or two cuffs for adults. One, sometimes you're filling them by saline or methylene blue, in case any rupture happen to be easy and early to detect any rupture for this one. And the idea is to reflect the laser for this. Awake tracheal intubation. So we have two options, either fiber optic intubation, which is preferable technique, and most of us are uh, aware about this one, and or the uh, awake video laryngoscopy, which is gaining popularity nowadays. It can be, it's alter, uh, can be alternative for awake fiber optic intubation, especially in cork in bottle phenomena. So what's cork in bottle phenomena? This is if you have the tumor or lesion uh, uh, hiding or obstructing most of the uh, glottic area except very narrow part. If you are putting the fiber optic through this one, the patient will suffocate. He cannot breathe and he will not cooperate with you, like this one. So the preferable part is to use uh, doing awake uh, video laryngoscopy using the video laryngoscopy and put smallest tube uh, that you can put through this uh, area. As we said, awake tracheostomy is a, uh, it was the gold standard technique in old days for in airway compromise. is associated with 30% complication like pneumothorax, bleeding, false passage. Uh, it depends on the patient compliance. Because patient is awake, distressed, he should lie uh, flat with neck extension, uh, manipulation of the trachea. So of course, it's not uh, something easy for the patient, but uh, still it can be the first choice for airway management in case of severe airway obstruction. In terms of ventilation, as we said, spontaneous ventilation is commonly used in pediatric population can be uh, used to perform dynamic or functional assessment of the vocal cords. Uh, low oxygen can be delivered nasally during uh, spontaneous ventilation. Apneic intermittent ventilation is a technique that after putting patient sleep, you will hyperventilate on 100% oxygen by using oxygen mask and then get, handle the patient to the surgeons. He will start to do laryngeal suspension. And uh, when the patient starts to desaturate around 90, the surgeon himself will insert into tracheal tube, usually non-cuffed one, connect to the uh, breathing uh, circuit, hyperventilate on 100% oxygen, and then when the situation comes up in the, uh, more than 90, or the surgeon will remove it and then continue the surgery again. It let give you apnea time around five to 10 minutes. Uh, it needs the patient to be fully relaxed on TV because no inhalation going uh, through uh, any tube. 
and um, uh, it's not suitable for significant lung disease or cardiovascular disease. And it is in uh, uh, article uh, mentioned a lot of uh, strategies for of ventilation for endoscopic laryngeal surgery. One of these study was uh, uh, for 350 patients and they discovered that the incidence of intraoperative laryngeal spasm of uh, intermittent uh, of apneic intermittent ventilation around 1.5 per 1.4% and the postoperative laryngeal spasm is 3.5%. Apneic oxygenation by Thrive with plus uh, nasal humidified uh, um, optic flow high flow this is a picture for this one is to get the component of this one is high flow up to 100 liter pushing oxygen to humidifier here, which go through a nasal cannula to the patient. This is a leading uh, study for the Thrive uh, done by uh, Patel for uh, difficult airway uh, patients, uh, presented by difficult airway. And they were looking for, by using the Thrive for the, um, the rising of entitled CO2 uh, episodes of desaturation and for how long the patient can tolerate apnea and uh, they discovered that the rate of uh, the rate of uh, increase of uh, internal co2 was 0.15 kilopascal per minute and no uh, desaturation below 90 percent and the average at the time is uh, was 17 minutes and from this study a lot of anesthetists start to use thrive not only for difficult airway management use it also for uh, short procedure uh, surgeries, like this study, which also uh, same results for the previous one. I mentioned if the patient with mild systematic disease, BMI less than 30, it can he can stay for up to 30 minutes, uh, apneic and uh, increasing of uh, uh, CO2 0.24 kilopascal per minute. So. For this kind of patient, you have to start the oxygenation at uh, 40 degree head up in semi sitting position on a rate of 70 liter for 10 minutes before starting the surgery. Uh, some papers or literature is discussing uh, that you can start by 40 liters because it's uh, unpleasant for the patient to have 70 liter uh, per minute. But anyhow, the most important is to start it as early as possible for 10 minutes before starting the surgery. Then after induction, the jaw thrust is required to keep airway patency, and this is very important. After the procedure, you can uh, wake up the patient fully reversed by face mask or inserting LMA until the patient again is fully conscious. Jaw ventilation was developed in 1960 and aiming to maintain adequate ventilation and good surgical access during original bronchoscopy. In 1967, Douglas Sanders uh, described the technique uh, allowing uninterrupted patient ventilation, at the same time not hiding the surgical access from the surgeons. So we have two types or two classifications of jet ventilations, either by location, supraglottic, subglottic, or transtracheal, or by frequency, which is low frequency, high frequency, superimposed high frequency, which is combination between low frequency and high frequency. These are the most uh, two popular devices, Manuget and Sanders. You can see here the structure for them. The component is a uh, pressure hose connected to the uh, oxygen pipe, giving pressure of oxygen about four atmospheric pressure. Then the pressure regulator, regulator valve. You can control the pressure in, uh, in Manuget, but you cannot control it in Sanders. Then the lever to push the jets of oxygen to the lung. Then pressure gauge here and at the end is jet ventilation tubing going to the patient. This is what we call the nasal jet tube. It is a new uh, device. Uh, it's like a nasal uh, pharyngeal uh, airway, but there is two tubes through this one, one connected to the jet ventilation and the other one used to measure the uh, airway pressure. It can be used either spontaneously or if the patient is uh, completely apneic. Uh, can be used in as a rescue and can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario, which is these easy to be inserted, and you can insert small tube through this blindly through the uh, through the wee nasal jet tube. And this is a superimposed high frequency jet ventilation. It's super, considered as a supraglottic uh, device, specialized laryngoscope, uh, surgical laryngoscope. Uh, you can see on the left side here 
to connect it to high frequency and low frequency jet ventilation. On the, on the right side here, one port will measure the pressure and the other port will measure the end tidal CO2. This is the most common device that we are using here. It's the Manson device for uh, subglottic uh, high frequency jet ventilation. Uh, you can uh, see here there's a bottom, this is on and off bottom. This is what we call laser bot uh, bottom, okay? It can be used also in the laser. And uh, the settings on the screen here is going for FI2 usually as 100%. Respiratory rates, it can give respiratory rate to from 100 to 300, but usually the standard is 150 uh, cycle per minute. And respiratory duration is 30% and driving pressure around two bar. The driving pressure is very important here because increasing, the more you increase the driving pressure, the more you have the risk for barotrauma. But, and the driving pressure is a, a factor that affecting the, the tidal volume for the patient, uh, not the, uh, um, to eliminate the CO2, not the respiratory rate. The more you increase the respiratory rate, the lower you will increase, uh, decrease the expiratory time. So it will not wash the CO2. If you want to wash the CO2, increase more the driving pressure, but be take care of the, uh, power trauma. This is the two catheter we are using for this one. So uh, you have one port here for jet ventilation, the other po port here to measure the pressure, uh, peak inspiratory pressure. This one is called uh, hand sucker monojet, and this one is called laser jet double human. Both of them we are using the, the, this both catheter with this machine. Okay. So this green called green basket. This is the idea to keep the the catheter in the middle of the trachea and to uh, avoid uh, mucosa and erosion and jetting uh, under the mucosa. Okay, I'll give you this picture, which can lead to distal obstruction in the trachea. So why jet ventilation here? Jet ventilation physiologically reduces the peak airway pressure, hemodynamically compromise less than intermittent positive pressure ventilation, Surgical wise, uh, give you uh, uh, minimal vocal cord and surgical field movement, improve the surgical axis, not hiding, there's no tubes, so it's tubeless field. Um, it can be used in laser surgery from the anesthetic side, also, it's good for airway surgery and can be used in emergency as transtracheal jet ventilation. The disadvantage of jet ventilation is potential risk of barotrauma, uh, potential for lower airway soiling in ENT surgery. If you are using this one, is if you are using supraglottic uh, jet ventilation, inhalation anesthesia often impractical, so you have to use TIVA. Uh, inadequate ventilation in severe lung disease and malposition of the catheter can lead to gastric distension or gastric rupture. Transclean CO2 monitoring is a non-invasive carbon dioxide monitoring have been uh, introduced strongly into our clinical practice nowadays uh, based on uh, Stowe uh, severing house electrode that measure the partial pressure of carbon dioxide after arterialization of the skin by local warming. So it depends on, on the heat, positive dilatation to measure the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide. And the sensors can be attached on ear lobule or chest or the forehead and providing continuous uh, non-invasive monitoring for CO2 and in addition to uh, oxygen, partial of oxygen. And it has been validated, validated in many studies. This one for enduring laparoscopic surgery or during cardiac ablation, and even outside the surgical field in uh, treating of non uh, chronic hypoventilation with non invasive uh, ventilation. So, the post operative care for this patient uh, is very important to um, extubate them or wake them up in semi sitting position and the extubation should be either fully awake or deep uh, to avoid the laryngeal spasm and have high risk for the laryngeal spasm. And uh, when you, before extubation, you have to be sure that the ENT surgery is around you for any emergency and to be sure that the emergency airway trolley is beside you. Um, if there is any uh, strider developed after the surgery, uh, you can treat it by nebulized epinephrine or consider HELOX. Uh, or dex another dose of dexamethasone, you have to give intraoperative dexamethasone to decrease the edema uh, or minimize the edema uh, after the surgery. And also, you can put them on humidified oxygen to decrease, uh, should be oxygen be humidified to decrease the uh, mucosal irritation and the dryness. And you can put them on high flow in the recovery. If you can feel that extubation is not in the side of the patient and there is every edema, you did, the, for example, leak test and it's positive, 
better to keep them intubated. They can stay for one or two days in the ICU until the edema will be resolved. We'll go for some spe specific procedures here. The most common is airway endoscopy. So in 1854, uh, the Spanish singer Gracia uh, succeeded to perform the first otolaryngoscopy. He first visualized his own larynx using dental mirror and the second hand using another mirror to reflect the sunlight. And then he applied this one on the patient to uh, analyze the phonation of the patients in front of him. In 1910, uh, Gustav Kielen uh, constructed the first suspension of la uh, laryngoscope, laryngoscopy. Uh, special laryngoscopy, not a tube, uh, but only sp spatula, and they hook the spatula as you can see here. Okay, so they can see the larynx, and he can work or be doing the surgery by his two hands. So this is general terms you can hear it during your daily uh, daily work. If you can find the patient is listed for pan endoscopy, you have to know what these terms indicate too. So pan endoscopy usually the surgeon wants to visualize the entire upper airway, including the post nasal space and the upper esophagus. And you usually are trying to mapping the tumor or taking biopsy from the tumor uh, in the in, in, in the upper airway. Facial bronchoscopy, either diagnostic or therapeutic for lesions in the respiratory tract down to the main bronchus. You can use uh, uh, tracheal dilatation for stenosis, putting stents, microlaryngoscopy, focusing purely on the larynx and vocal cord uh, uh, for a variety of pathology like polyp nodules or vocal cord tumors. This is the rigid bronchoscopy, and you can find sometimes we are doing ventilation here in the side arm, okay, which is inefficient. You have to use sometimes Steva with this one, and you can see also here how the neck is extended, so you have to take care from the position of the neck. This is what we call the microlaryngoscopy set. This is the anterior commercial laryngoscope. You can see here the support for supraglottic jet ventilation. This is the fiber optic light source and camera, if you want video camera here. And from this one, you can start to suspend or for suspending the larynx. Like this one, I don't know if it's clear or not, but you can see this is a laryngoscope, surgical laryngoscope and suspended to a metallic frame around the patient here so the surgeons can do the surgery by two hands and uh, clear uh, view. So for the anesthetic management for airway endoscopy, as we said, usually we are using the MLT um, unless tubeless field is required, like in the rigid bronchoscopy or uh, tumor in the posterior commissure. Again, you can start uh, maintenance either inhalational or TIVA, uh, we can mitigate the stress response by topicalization and short-acting opioid, as, as we said, the remipentanil. Uh, uh, profound muscle relaxation is very important. No chance for the patient to cough or move while uh, rigid bronchoscopy uh, in the trachea or in the larynx. Dexamethasone to decrease the post-operative edema. And the intraoperative uh, ventilation, as we said, either uh, we inserted the MLT, so you will go for standard IPPV. Uh, or tubeless field like spontaneous apneic and jet ventilation, as we discussed before. Complication of microlaryngoscopy or microlaryngeal surgery, interoperably loss of airway, myocardial ischemia and arrhythmia. As we said, this is very stressful for the patient. Intraoperative awareness because of the, uh, there's problem how to deliver the uh, volatile agent for the patient. That's why TIVA is very important. Massive bleeding, esophageal perforation pulmonary aspiration, dental trauma, laryngeal spasms, or corneal abrasions. Postoperatively, he can develop airway obstruction, laryngeal spasms, negative pressure pulmonary edema, pulmonary aspiration, in addition to sore throat, respiratory compromise, hemopsis, or temporomandibular joint deterioration. Uh, so we'll go for the airway laser surgery. Laser is an uh, acronym for light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation. In 1954, Charles Townes described the first amplification and generation of electromagnetic waves by stimulating emission by using microwave, which uh, he called uh, maser or microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. In 1960, uh, Theodore uh, Miman uh, produced the light amplification that we know nowadays uh, by using rubbery uh, crystal or uh, android light. 
So the types of the laser usually uh, according to the, they are named according to their medium. The most common type you are using for airway are the carbon dioxide laser, argon and potassium uh, titanium phosphate uh, and uh, diode laser. Why we are using laser, when we are using laser, sorry. So we are using this one for removal of benign nodules, polyp, cysts or granuloma, vocal cord dysfunction, recurrent papillomatosis, or malignant growth on the vocal cords. Why we are using laser better than uh, normal surgery? A less scar formation, less protective pain, uh, less post-operative pain uh, and edema, good uh, hemopsis and lower rate of infection. And the complication, which is very important uh, in this topic of laser, is to we can divide them into general complication and airway hazards or airway fire. So the general complication uh, is eye damage. That's why we have to uh, all the stuff uh, do in, in, in the theater should be specialized Google according to the type of the laser used and the patient himself. Even you have to tap and pat his eye, and sometimes I put in even uh, uh, goggles on his eye. Uh, if the nieces or doctor or anyone wearing eyeglass, uh, if the laser beam hit the eyeglass from front, no problem, but the problem it can be hit from the side, so it can be doing corneal injury or retinal uh, damage. So it's very important to wear the goggles. Skin burn, we can avoid this one by uh, wrapping the head of the patient by wet drops uh, to cover all the face and the upper part of the chest. Other complications in misdirect of the laser, which depend on the surgeons or the operator himself. Airway fire depends on, you know, all of us, we know this triangle depends on three components. You have to have uh, uh, oxidizers, fuel, and uh, activated source of energy. So our oxidizer here is oxygen and nitrous oxide. The uh, activation energy is uh, our uh, laser or the thermi in case and the fuel is the drafts our uh, pipping agents around uh, the field of the surgery. This is a picture of how the uh, fire uh, started in the intra MLT tube, okay? And this is the effect after doing the fire, after the fire happened for the larynx and vocal cords. So what we do, what we can do to take our precautions that these catastrophe events will not happen. Uh, we can reduce the FI2 less than 30% or up to 21% as long as the patient can tolerate uh, low FI2. Avoiding the use of nitrous, of nitrous oxide, which also help in, in, in ignition of the uh, fire. Using laser resistance in tracheal tube as we, we saw before, these two kinds of tube, or intermittent uh, ventilation technique or jet ventilation technique. Uh, using non-compassable uh, drafts or non-reflective -reflect surgical instruments. If airway fire developed, so you have to immediately declare with a fire, immediate cessation of the laser, flooding the surgical uh, field with saline. Uh, uh, usually there is a 50 ml of uh, saline is uh, ready on the table beside the surgeons. So in case of any fire, you ha he has to flood the surgical field by saline. Stop airway gas ventilation and remove the endotracheal tube immediately. Once the fire is subsided and ex extinguished, start to ventilate the patient by uh, oxygen mask, uh, sorry, by a mask uh, with air, and uh, be ready to restart reintubate re the patient again to secure the airway. Examination of the airway is very important uh, to check any evidence for thermal injury, remnant of intracranial tube, or any uh, airway depression. So it appears from this lecture is good communication with the surgeon is very important, okay? So because to have, you should reach midway between the uh, decisions, uh, between the analysis and the surgeons. Uh, suspect difficult airway, even if the patient is asymptomatic. Review the CT scan and mesendoscopy before induction. Ensure uh, patent upper airway uh, in thrive and uh, jet ventilation. This, this will really dramatically reduce the incidence for uh, borrowed trauma. Be aware of the hazards and the precaution of laser surgery and know how to manage in case it happens. Thank you.